Well, I'd like to begin this year the way we ended last year. Oh, gee. Big salute Hammered. 2023. Oh. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hung over. You know, who really deserves our cheers here into the beginning of 2023 and a new year. Deserve a break. Yes. I, is our I troops. Say, I say the entire military goes on libo for like the next week. Just oh. everybody on vacation. We got it. Me and Joe, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll fly the, or drive the boats. We'll keep the bad guys at bay. Yeah, the bad people won't uh, mind that at all. We'll stop them. We'll stop. Yeah, of course we won't. Not only are these people brave, man, they know what the hell they're doing. Our troops, big salute to our troops. On behalf of the men and women in Navy Federal Credit Union and the people making podcast in Mom's Basement, a big salute to our troops. Happy 2023. Thank you for a phenomenal 2022. Here's to even more this year. Let's go stack some Benjamins together, shall we? Here's the song that we'd like to do for all the younger set of people, the teenagers and what have you. This one's called Vacation Zone. Vacation's all that is over, is over. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Look, I'm sorry, I- I'm a little late today and I'm super frazzled. There was just so much I told everybody I would help him out with. I had to help Joe's mom clean out her hamster cage. Joe needed a fourth player for his latest board game and OG needed me to bury a body. So like that was a drive. If you feel like your calendar is too packed, today we have just the guy to help as we welcome the author of Overcommitted, Don Davis. For our TikTok Minute, we learned some special jargon from the biggest fundraising rounds in the world. In our headlines, the pandemic has many employees demanding some major changes to their retirement plans. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Curtis, who's wondering about legacy planning with credit cards. And then I'll share some New Year's trivia. And now, two guys who are appropriately committed to helping you stack the bees. It's Joe and O J J J J G. Hey, welcome to 2023. I am Joe Salsi. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. I'm so, so happy that you found us. So sit back, relax, get ready for another 12 months of money fun. We are rested and ready after a great week last week with the most inspirational interviews we had in 2022 and nothing we want better than to inspire you more in 2023. And here to help me do that across the card table, signed up for active duty for another year, Mr. OG. How are you, man? Fantastic. When did we decide, by the way, that it was 2023 and not 2023 because i was thinking back it used to be you know 2002 2003 2009 That's right. yeah and then it kind of turned to 2010 and and i'm really thankful for that that you know that we're not saying 2023 that just it's just, just exhausting uh, you got to take a break halfway through that i don't have to, nobody's got time for that yeah it was a weird couple of years but I guess maybe in the, or the 100 years ago they said did they say 1903 or did they say 1903 I don't, who knows? 1900 and three. 1900 and three. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's probably All the not. English agers are rolling over going, no. I got to say, I love the holiday season. People that are watching video of this can see that I'm wearing my Christmas story, 5k, 10k, uh, long sleeve shirt that I ran a couple of years ago. So on one side, I miss it. On the other side, I don't OG. I mean, I've got some, well, this is some audio from my niece's middle school band concert. And let me, oh boy. let me play this. Cause this is kind of what happened with me during the holidays. Like with all these things, it starts off good, right? With a solo, you know, kids standing up on the trumpet, doing Pretty good nervous. stuff. Pretty Cheryl and I, solo. I know, right? In front of all the moms and bads, and here comes the whole band. And of 
course, the standing ovation we gave him at the end. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Duh. yeah it starts out. So that, that's how your holiday started out and how they ended. It was started out like a trumpet solo from uh, from sixth grade. That, and then the, and then the rest of the band got together. You just kind of slide into home. You don't care if you're safe or if you're out. It's just over. And uh, you're ready to get all squared away for 2023. I've been saving that for, for th- uh, the week that we were off. I saw that actually on TikTok. Big thanks to Quick Talk on TikTok is the name of that producer. I'm like, that is the holiday spirit. Well, we're into 2023. Dr. Don Davis is here, OG, to talk about overwhelm. I think the best time to talk about overwhelm is before it begins, right? The best battle, according to Sun Tzu, is the one that's never fought. We're going to try not to fight the overwhelm battle in 2023. So let's get our mindset right. We got a big, big cautionary headline. But before even that, I think the best way to kick off the year is probably with this. Well, maybe not the best way to kick off the year, but that keeps the podcast operating. So so we probably, probably needed to get that done. All right. That's out of the way. Now, Steve, let's get this thing moving. Crank it up. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes from a retirement planning company called Icon Savings Plan. We will link to them in the show notes, but they just recently did a survey, OG, that I find incredibly, um, well, let's just say interesting for now. They surveyed 1,650 actively contributing retirement plan participants and actively employed workers without access to a plan. And they found that when it comes to retirement planning, 78% of people in the survey, 78% want access to emergency savings through their retirement plan, which is up from 53% in 2020. Hmm. They want to be able to get at their retirement money. That seems like a red flag to me. Well, I mean, obviously it is when you're thinking about retirement versus spending money now, but it also kind of checks with what's going on. You know, credit card balances are increasing, savings rates are decreasing, kind of the COVID extra money that was lying around uh, is kind of getting spent through with inflation being quite high. And so, yeah, people are looking at kind of the next level of that, which is how do I get money out of my other accounts that normally, you know, are kind of tucked away. Many of our listeners uh, feel lucky if they get a match. If you get a match from your company, you are pretty lucky. You should be taking advantage of that. But how about this one? 80%, nearly the same number, would prefer a cash bonus instead of a match, which is up from 55% in 2020. Again, a disturbing jump in the number of people. Yeah, forget about give me more retirement. Give me more now. Yeah. Well, and that just backfires so much in the long run. I mean- in the short term, when you see, you know, you're making $70,000 a year, you're putting in your 3%, which is 2,100 bucks, and you're getting a $2,100 match. You're like, Ugh, I'd rather have the cash. Like what's two grand in my retirement? And it's, you're right. It's nothing. It's $2,000 in your retirement today is worth hardly anything, but it's the $2,000 that compounds that pays dividends that continues to grow over the next 30, 40, 50 years. And your contributions that continue to increase, because if you set it at a percentage, as you continue to make more money, you're going to make more contributions by default, right? Because it's set as a percentage. Same thing with your company contributions. Ask somebody who's on the precipice of retiring who is financially successful and say, how much of your 401k was your money and how much of your 401k is employer match money? See what those numbers are. You'll see that a large percentage, a large percentage of 401k balances are employer matching contributions. You've got to take advantage of those. Well, think about this. If you don't save for retirement into equities, into stocks, you save very conservatively into the guaranteed account. Um, With that $2,000, your money is going to grow slower than inflation. So you're going to have to save dollar for dollar the same amount you're going to want to spend. Right. Which is why you want to take advantage of that because of the fact that think about how hard that is. If if you want to retire in no, thirty it's, years, it's, it's impossible. Well, that's it's mathematically right. impossible. So you're spending fifty thousand dollars a year today, and you get, and you're going to retire in thirty years, right? So how much is this inflation adjusted fifty thousand in thirty years from now? It's a hundred and twenty thousand. 
And that's just at 3% inflation, right? We're talking about high inflation right now, but just kind of historically 3%. So how big of a bucket do you need? You need $3 million, finger in the wind, about 3 million bucks to take 120 grand out, okay? How much money are you gonna make over the next 30 years at 50,000 a year times 30 years? 1.5 million. Now you say, well, but I'm gonna get pay raises along the way. Absolutely you will, 100%. Yeah. Are you gonna get double pay raises? That would basically mean you have to save every dollar, not pay taxes, not pay house payment, not buy food. It's impossible to save for retirement if you don't put it in stocks. It's, it, it doesn't work. You can't and this do is that. also why the employer match back to the original thing is so important. Yeah. Like every leg up you can get, you got to get. Yeah. Yeah. We worry about things like, you know, well, the costs in my 401k are too high. My employer has a crappy plan and I've got crappy options that blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, you're getting a hundred percent match on your portfolio. It's like, there's nothing else in the universe where you put in 2,100 and get 2,100. It's a hundred percent return. Like who cares what the fees are? relative to that, like take your match. But people say, I don't want to put money in my 401k because the fees are too high. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you pull the lever, you get free money. The frustrating thing here for me with these statistics is increasingly people want to mortgage the future to make today okay. We saw statistics before the holiday that people knew that inflation was high. They could feel the effect of inflation. Then we asked, what were they going to do differently with their holiday spending? And what was the thing? Nothing. They nothing. were going to change nothing. Like I see I'll it coming. It. Yeah. Yeah. I see that the, that it says I need to slow down. There's a cliff ahead. The, the road is closed and I'm going to keep going 80 miles an hour over the cliff. I'm just going to make it happen. And then later on, we're going to, you know, get on social media and blame everybody. We're going to blame the government. We're going to blame our neighbor. We're going to blame my boss. I'm going to blame all these people when I did nothing during that time. And don't get me wrong. There probably is systemically a bunch of blame to go around. We've covered that every year on here, but still, I think the first thing we got to do is look in the mirror and go, I can't mortgage tomorrow to make today. Okay. I can't do it. Yeah. I can't, I, I can't do all these people are saying I'm okay with being screwed in retirement so I can keep doing things the same today. No, you can't, you can't, we, yeah. we have to get people going this is the other time way. of the year too. You know, when people are starting to think, I mean, you're starting, you're thinking about it, right? You're going to the gym. You and I ate too much over the holidays. I got to, you know, got, well, most of us, not you, Joe, but most of us are working on our summer beach bodies at this point. Easy. I mean, you're working on it. You're like a beach ball belongs at the easy, beach. E easy. Um, standing right here. There's a six pack hidden under here somewhere, protective coating. But we also work on our money at this time, right? You start thinking about cash flow and that sort of thing. I would challenge everybody to look at it from the perspective of everything counts. There's so many times where we look at our budget or we look at our spending or we look at our income and we go, well, I, you know, I can't change that. Well, that, that's, that's just, you know, no, you can. Everything counts. Now you may choose not to, but if you approach it from the perspective of everything is on the table, you can start kind of like that big rocks thing from Stephen Covey. If you just automatically say, I'm not going to change any of this stuff, you're not giving yourself a lot of outs, a lot of choices. Put everything on the table. Say, hey, do I need to live in this house? Do I need a $2,500 house payment? Could I find something different? Maybe you choose not to. You're like, but the kids like the house and I like the pool. And okay, that's cool. But start from the perspective of everything counts and see what changes you can make to make sure that if you are being affected by inflation, rising costs and energy and all that other sort of stuff. What can you do to kind of offset it on your own? Maybe it is getting more money. We have Dr. Don Davis on today specifically because this is the one time a year that people are open to exponential thinking, to new thinking, to wiping the board clean and not thinking about what I did before. But, you know, we're open to it right now for the next couple of weeks. And then we close back up, yeah. right? And we, we just go back to incremental, you once, know, 2% raises. Once Valentine's raise happens, fine. Valentine's Day happens. Yep. It's over. Or as we called around here, Joe's birthday month. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I'm completely with you that this is the time if you're going to blow stuff up and you're going to do things completely differently, like now's the time to chart that new course. Do it this week. Make a new plan. That's why I love this. Love this topic today. Hey, it's time for our TikTok Minute, time in the show when we shine a light on some TikTok creator either doing something brilliant or, air quotes, brilliant. OG, which one we got today? I'm always voting air quotes brilliant. You don't even have to ask. 
This comes to us from Mary, and Mary sent us a conversation, OG, between angel investors discussing uh, Sam Bankman Freed, who I think people, more people know that name now than knew uh, <laughs> six months ago, the creator of FTX, the firm that last year in the fourth quarter just completely blew up and really kind of was a Ponzi scheme started unraveling in a hurry. Yeah. Bad harbinger things to come too. I think for a lot of crypto and really made a lot of people question crypto, but these are two angel investors discussing the business plan when, uh, Sam Bankman freed asked them to invest in his company. Pitched us in that $17 billion round. And I did a zoom with him. And after the Zoom, I'm like, this doesn't make much sense, but I'll have my team do some work. We did some work and we sent him a two-page deck and we said, here are our recommendations for taking the next step. One was the formation of a board. The second was the creation of dual class stock. The third was some reps and warranties around affiliated transactions and related party transactions. And the person that worked there called us back and literally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you, said, go f*** yourself. That comes to TikTok from the All In podcast. OG, oh, we talk a lot about doing your homework, about due diligence, about diving into investments. And because your neighbor's doing it does not make it a great idea. The more I hear from experts and people that knew and talked to Sam Bankman Freed, even beforehand, before it blew up, like this guy, for people that know what they're doing, having a board of directors is just, I mean, it's not even basic it's elementary it's it's job one have a board of directors number two dual class stock when's the last time you saw any new company that didn't have dual class stock i i see it all the time i don't know that i necessarily love it i don't think i love it but i get that that's that's just the way the thing works lately just the number of people coming out going yeah i knew it was going to blow up i kind of hate the mm -hmm. me too and the monday morning quarterback yeah i knew it all along that drives me crazy. Well, yeah. yeah. And you see a lot of other people who go, yeah, I knew this was coming, but I also invested 50 million into this company. Right. And you go, what? Huh? What are you talking about? Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of dominoes to fall yet on this. I think there's even some scuttlebutt around the advertising. They bought sponsorships for Major League Baseball and all the celebrities and that sort of thing. It's like, how much of this rolls downhill to, to the, I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't even 11 months ago with the big, the big Matt Damon commercial on the Super Bowl. The future favors the bold, right? It was like, if that was not just the, the calling card of this is the top. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what was. I don't know what, what, what song you needed to hear sung in the background when Matt Damon's going, future favors the bold with crypto. It's like, Okay. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of, I told you so's going around, but then there's a lot of people who say, I told you so. And I also, I lost 20 million. You're like, what? I thought you told me so. I know. I know. You didn't. <laughs> you should have told yourself. You were on the show. I saw you. I saw you schlepping this stuff, man. So yeah, this it's is, horrible. this is no fun when it comes. I mean, sadly this happens, right? It's Bernie Madoff, this guy, and then the backside of it, everybody's like, well, you should have known, right? With Bernie Madoff, it's like, you should have known. How did you not know? You should have known. It's like, this dude did this, this crime for a generation. There was a generation of people who were swindled by this guy. And I bet that it didn't start out as swindling. You know what I mean? Same thing sure. with this. I think we'll probably find out it didn't start out that way. It turned into it because people, you know, they, it's greed and fear basically both sides of it and well every time i see him interviewed i think this is a guy who got in over his head and don't get me wrong that's what he wants us to believe is that he's a guy just got in over his head oh but i didn't even know i was just i was just kind of doing my thing i didn't you know what geez i didn't really know what happened to that 70 billion dollars it beats me yeah yeah it's a it's a long con and he is for sure still playing it it seems like anyway you hear these stories behind the scenes of him and his team uh, telling employees that they really need to invest in the in the company. They need to put their whole 401k into the company and people losing all of their money that work for the company because they went ahead and 
to be a team player, went ahead yeah. and did it. You know, you hear what you want to hear and see what you want to see. You know, I saw an article over the holidays, a uh, cover page of Fortune magazine that said the next Warren Buffett and it had the picture of this dude on it. And I don't think Warren Buffett was like, oh, yeah, that's that's the guy that I'm going to hire next. <laughs> it almost always boils down to the same idiom. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And it sounds so trite. And I live in Dallas. There's a new um, financial planning firm that's kind of spending a whole bunch of money on advertising here. They're headquartered in, uh, in Arizona, but I see their commercials all the time. And they've got a tagline that's basically something along the lines of, you know, hey, we're always fiduciaries and we're always da 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 which we've talked about here a thousand times. That word means absolutely nothing to anyone at this point. Anybody can say it. There's no repercussions. It's, it's almost, <laughs> there, there's no teeth in it whatsoever. And in the same commercial that this guy talks about how we don't get commissions and we're fiduciaries, he goes, and I think you should buy this annuity. Because it's the greatest thing in the universe. And, you know, if you're concerned Just about the market, flaunting it, put $200,000 in here, it's worth 400000 you get a bonus, da, da, da. he's going through all this whole thing, this whole pitch. And, and you know, nobody's going to, there's, there's nothing that will happen to him. And if it does, it's going to happen in 10 years from now, once all of the, all of the people are already in trouble. You got to look at everything, I think, when, especially when it comes to, the story that's being told, a little skepticism, just a little, you know, and just go, so I'm putting in 200 grand and now it's worth 400. You know, I, I, I get how that works in my 401k over 20 years. I put in 200,000, my employer puts in 200,000 worth 400. Like I get that math, but how does it work when I put in 200 instantaneously it's worth four? That doesn't, that doesn't check. You know, the insurance company is not in the habit of giving away money. They're, 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 they're a for-profit entity, right? They're, they're not going to say like, hey, Joe, you look like you've worked real hard over your life, so we'll do you a solid. Why don't you give us 200? We'll give you another 200 on top. But there's got to be a catch. And I'm not saying the catch is bad. I'm just saying you have to look at it and go, huh? Nothing else in my life works this way. You know, some, some investor or some program or, you know, we hear about this in other areas of the world too, like real estate or something. It's like, you know, let's go buy this apartment building and you can you know, double your money in six months. You go, huh? I mean, maybe, maybe it can happen. And I'm certain that it has happened. But at the same token, don't, don't you think you should probably just be a, just a smidge skeptical? Just a little bit. When you're looking at your financial plan this year and you're starting to do reviews and updates, do you want, you know, do you put in your plan 15% of your growth? Well, of course not. Why? Why, why would you? Because it paints too rosy of a picture, right? What do you use? Seven, eight, six and a half, right? You, you, you plan for conservative things and be happy when you get 10 or 12. Has, has the market gone up 15 before? Absolutely. It's also gone down 20, <laughs> you know, see, see 2022, you know? Anyways, I just, I get frustrated with these things because, because it's not, it's not, I told you so. It's just, I'm, I'm frustrated because, it's just another person who like hoodwinked 2 million people. And now the domino effects of this are well, those people yes. are going to go, I can never trust the financial system again. Right. Which is not the takeaway. And it's like, no, no, no. You weren't in the financial system. You were schnookered by a con agent or, you know, con man. And it's because you wanted something that's never been true to be true. This was the case uh, we've had many people say this, but when you see one thing one time, it might be their shtick. But when you see something over and over and over, it's a truth. And the truth is, it wasn't true in 2000 when people said it was the new economy, right? Remember people saying the new economy were like, what, what, what? 2007, when we heard that real estate and documentation and, and who cares how much debt you had, that that didn't matter anymore. What? It's always mattered. The old economy and, and companies making profits always mattered. Documentation's always mattered. Having a good credit score has always mattered. After this, this run up, like doing your basic due diligence on a company before you invest money in them still matter. Investing in a thing, doing some due diligence in it before it still matters. It's still there. There's, I feel like we've been for 11 years complaining about people doing the same thing over and over again. If, if there's one drum we've beaten, it's the same one that there is no new way. There is no new way. What Mark Twain say? History, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Right. 
Don, D- Dr. Don Davis is a phenomenal gentleman who himself has found like a lot of us and stackers. I know you're all talented at a bunch of stuff, which means we peel off often way more than we can actually juggle. And that's when we start to get into trouble. So I felt like a great way for us to begin 2023 OG was with a look at overwhelm and speaking with Don Davis about his new project, which we'll talk about specifically about avoiding overwhelm and taking a scientific look at this was a great way to start. I know many years we start off with a motivational speech. I think you just gave that earlier. So we've got that down. Didn't didn't try to, but okay. (laughs) Instead of a good motivational speaker, I think having a scientist talk to us about overwhelm is great. He's up next, but first, Doug, I think you've got some trivia for us. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and whoo, I am just now getting back to being myself after my New Year's party. Lost a little time there. What year is it? 20? Speaking of losing things, you know there's a lot of crime on New Year's, right? Watch your purses, ladies. So my question is, what's the most common crime on New Year's Eve? I'll be back right after I peek outside just to make sure. Hey there, stackers. I'm Celebration Security Sue and Holiday Crime Watcher. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. A lot of people are out partying on New Year's, and that means they leave a particular item home alone. A lot of other people are drinking alcohol, you know the type, and might feel emboldened to commit a certain type of crime. And no, I'm not talking about eating more than your fair share of the shrimp. So, what's the most common crime on New Year's? Car theft. And now, to help make sure you don't let people steal too much of your time, it's Don Davis. I'm so excited we're kicking off the new year with this gentleman. Don Davis joins us. How are you, man? Happy New Year. I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, happy new year to you as well. I'm excited about 2023, but I have to tell you, Don, that when I first heard about this book and about your work on this book, that I thought, man, this describes me overcommitted. <laughs> like, I, I can't be the only one telling you that, Don. I feel like it's a lot of us these days. No, and I also am somebody who's overcommitted as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it fits us both, but also probably a lot of other people that are listening to this as well. And, you know, I sort of call myself a, a, a long-term overcommitted person who's trying to stay committed without being overcommitted. <laughs> so, well, you, yes. you describe your life in one sentence, I think, near the beginning of the book as a three-ring circus, which sounds very much like mine here in Mom's Basement making podcasts. But tell me about you and your personal experience with overcommitment and trying to solve that. Yeah, so just in general – the way I would sort of frame it up is that, you know, I have a a very good professional career and have had for all of my life. At one point I was traveling to multiple continents, you know, sort of floating around the world. And in the midst of that floating around the world, I was teaching for two to three universities online. In addition to that, I had three kids at home. uh, So frequently had a suitcase packed. There was even one point in time where I had, commitments with regards to my kids. So my kids had like sporting events and things like that going on. In addition to that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of preparing my dissertation. So I've got, I'm at a, a, a sporting event for my daughter and I've got all of my papers for my dissertation kind of laid out on the bleachers, <laughs> you know, laptop in my lap. And, and my wife leans over and she goes, Hey, she's about to score. And so I'm like, you know, instantly look up, watch my daughter score. But, you know, I'm missing out on what I would say life and missing out on key points that I wanted to, you know, also be attentive to. And that's what I try to deal with a little bit in the book as well is just I, I'm certainly not a perfect person. And I uh, frequently sort of revert to these uh, overcommitted elements as well. And so I have to just be careful and, and have a lot of guardrails in place for that. It's funny because I only laughed while you were describing that because, you know, you laugh because you want to cry because you're right. (laughs) We've got 50 things going on. 
is it worse now coming out of COVID for most of us? Are we getting overcommitted? Because I'm so happy to see you, Don. I'm so happy to be talking to people. I'm so happy to be, you know, coming out of my cocoon. It feels like overcommitment. It's a ripe time for overcommitment. Yeah. So I'm working with a lot of different clients right now. There was a meeting that was coming up. It was a very important meeting for that client. And I knew exactly what they would do. They would book themselves right up to this absolutely critical meeting and not take the important time to prepare. And so I scheduled a meeting with the client and essentially showed up 30 minutes in advance of this most important meeting and said, look, this meeting actually is not for me and you. This meeting is for you to prepare because I know if I just leave it up to you, what's (laughs) going to happen is we're going to show up to the next meeting and you're going to be preparing the first part of the meeting And I need you to show up with answers to this meeting and not like waste, you know, 25 people's worth of time. We need to sort of come into this meeting really strong and and know exactly what it is that we want to do instead of having time for you to get caught up in things like that. The next 25 minutes for this session essentially is for you to do all that preparation. We're then going to go to the next meeting. And I know that you're going to come in there prepared because you're not going to use this time for anything else. You're going to use this time to get yourself ready. And in sort of that moment for me was that initial spark. I have coaching clients as well that during the pandemic, they were saying, you know, Hey, look, I feel like I'm, I just got way too many things and they're leading to a point where I don't necessarily want to go. And then the last part was my daughter, I saw her committing a lot of the same sins that I've committed as well in my life, where you have important things going on with your kids, plus your professional life and everything else. And you're trying to figure out how does it fit in? It's best to first figure out what you want to do and then figure out how to fit things in versus doing it the other way around. And so those three elements kind of came together as, hey, look, right now is the time for this book. And, you know, from it, I saw that, you know, even Microsoft had conducted a study and saw that there are three peaks that all of us now have in work that that we do based on a lot of the, the data that they're collecting from the Teams app that they have. And they saw during the pandemic that we all started 8 a.m. There's another peak that happens after, you know, your local time, lunchtime. And then there's a third peak that happens in every single day that happens around 10 or 11 o'clock with a lot of professionals as well that all of a sudden came about because of the pandemic. So there is a third peak now in everybody's work day. I want to ask you just, I'm just so curious. What did that client say when you told them, Hey, I'm not meeting with you. This is your prep time. He actually said, thank you. Yeah. He said, uh, I think he took a breath whenever he first heard it, you know, trying to figure out like, should I be mad? Should I be shocked? Should I, but I mean, at the end of the day, he just came back and said, you know what? You're right. I would have showed up to that meeting very unprepared. And, um, you know, I appreciate the time. And so, so thank you. So, I mean, now he's actually, one of the things that I call out in the book actually is time blocking. So, You know, I said, you know, look, if you just leave your calendar up where people can see it and like book time more readily, they will fill your time for you. The right thing to do for yourself as well as everybody else in your life is to time block and sort of make sure that you have segments of time where you can prepare. And so, you know, he and I have kind of circled back, you know, later on and he said, you know, is there a better way to to kind of manage this? And I said, well, my suggestion would be find elements of time that you have during the day where you could say, you know what, I'm going to use this time as prep time. If I prepare quickly or if I don't need to prepare for things, I'll give the time back. I'll open it back up for people to book time. But you can hold that time so that people can't fill your calendar because, I mean, this guy's calendar was like beginning of the morning to end of the day, sometimes, you know, going way late in the day. And he just would have never had the time to prepare otherwise. I found time blocking work for me done. And by the way, before it was a thing, I just realized that to-do lists weren't working. And so I just said, but if I put up my calendar, I look at my calendar all day long. What do I got to go to next? And if I just make a date with myself, it works. It sounds like you're saying that from a much more scientific nature than the way I did it, time blocking is, is a good strategy for a lot of us. Yeah, I, I found that for a lot of my 
coaching clients as well as the professional clients that I work with, you know, on a daily basis, it definitely works for them. Interestingly enough, I have one senior executive who has told his entire team that they're not to book any meetings during lunch hour. Well, that was the only time that they had available. And so those individuals now are sort of struggling with how do they manage the expectations of the executive versus, you know, what they need to do. We'll see how this all plays out. I mean, I still don't fully understand whether or not if, if they'll continue to book meetings during their lunchtime. One of my podcasts, I have two podcasts. I have one that focuses on life sciences and one of them that focuses in on the food you should eat daily. There's a doctor out of Canada that said that he wanted a podcast. And so I frequently get on on the air and, and talk to him about things that we should do. One of the interviews that I interestingly did with him was that you should be taking time out to eat more appropriately because it, it helps kind of your mental state and, and other things. And um, one of the things that I had said to one of the doctors that we had on and interviewed was, well, I frequently drink my lunch and not meaning alcohol, by the way. Right. <laughs> so, I was going to say, I I've, had those, I've had those days, Don. That's those right. are good days. <laughs> I frequently would have, a, a, you know, a, one of the meal shakes. And then, uh, you know, I wonder why I carry around all this extra weight. But one of the reasons why this doctor had said that was that your body needs that time to like chew and process and, and other things to be able to appropriately prepare the digestive system. So if your meal doesn't really have a scent in preparation and things like that, you're kind of completely depleting your system here of, of the opportunity to help you. And so eating lunch while meeting probably isn't the better, a better way to, to use your, your time during the day. And so that was one of the things that they suggested is, you know, hey, just take the time to make sure that you eat as well. It is interesting, though, that bad food, you know, in our bodies is a part of being overcommitted and maybe drinking too much is a part of being. I mean, and I'm being serious yeah. that it truly is like at the end of the day, if you're listen, if I'm going on Microsoft Teams at 10 p.m., I might self-medicate with a drink. <laughs> At the end of the day, but you do look at this much more scientifically than some of the motivational people we have begun prior years with, which is why I wanted to talk to you. You talk about the three dimensions of commitment. Can you walk through this structure with us so our stackers know exactly what you're talking about? Yeah. So with regards to time, you have to think about the time that you have available, how you're going to use that time. And then lastly, the, the third dimension is really like your processes and systems in that time. What this brings me back to, which I think will be easier to digest a little bit overall, is my definition of overcommitment. Mm. So whenever you think about the definition of overcommitment, it's easy to look at somebody's calendar and say, hey, look, you're double booked or triple booked, which, by the way, we all know, you know, isn't really possible you know, <laughs> for right. us to be in two or three places at once, at some point, you're going to have to make it. What decision. are we, not an airline? Come on, we can't be, <laughs> right. we can't be double booked. Exactly. <laughs> I'll sell the same seat two or three right. times. But in addition to that element of having time stacked, you know, one thing on top of the other, the other thing that I would also say is that you could be overcommitted into things that you don't want to work on as an individual. An example of this would be, let's say that of all of the things that I want to work on in a given day, I have some family time and then I have some professional time. Out of those two elements of time, what exactly is it that you want to do with those elements of time also has to be worked into that overcommitment, right? So I could be spending 90% of my time on my professional life and 10% on my personal life, but I actually want a closer balance between the two. And a lot of people talk about work-life balance, but I, I sort of say that as a person, we are also multidimensional in that same way, in that we probably have a lot of different things that we want to do. There are personal things that I want to work on that has nothing to do with my family. And then I have personal things that I want to work on that has everything to do with my family. So those sort of elements also have to be worked into this thought process of, how do you use your time and are you overcommitted in one thing versus another? Boy, what a great time to be thinking about this today. Like it sounds like there's some planning involved here, but where do I start then, Don? Right. So 
I walk through this process of setting out those categories in your life. What categories do you want to work on? I mentioned two of them just a moment ago. I have four personal, professional, financial, and fitness. So those are my four categories. And under those categories, then I have goals. I have things that I actually want to do related to each one of those. And then under each one of those goals, I have tasks that, you know, roll up to the goals. And so the best way to walk through this is to first set categories and then secondly, work on, you know, having goals that support those categories, you know, as well. What happens then, then, you know, back to overcommitment. So then, is that my framework so that if something then doesn't show up on this list and it ends up in my inbox or on my phone, whatever it might be, that's when I say no, if it doesn't fit those four categories? So a lot of us wind up in this situation where we're having to figure out what is the balance between the things that I want and the things that I have to do, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we all sort of have to walk this tightrope. And there's something on my website, anybody that's out there can go to my website and I have something called the overcommitment DARE. And so what DARE stands for is delegate, automate, reschedule, or eliminate. So the, it's an acronym. Oh. And so you can take the DARE for free. There's no, you know, you don't have to buy the book or anything sure. like that. You can, you can go take the DARE without the rest of the book. But I would think that the book would also support you a little bit better in terms of having the right structure in place first. Once you know what it is that you want to work on, there are ways that you can color things in your calendar and things like that. I go through this in the book, how to technically set it up, you know, whether it's Outlook or Google, you know, you can go through actually setting up your calendar so that you can see how many of the things that you're doing are contributing versus other things that are on your calendar that are not contributing to oh. the things that you want to work on. And then secondarily, you probably have some things that you have to shed, right? So the people that or in my life are frequently around me going, I don't understand how you do all this stuff in a day. Well, one, I have a lot of systems and processes that I've developed over the years that help support my lack of overcommitment, I would say at this point in my life. I also tell people that the number one thing in working through this overcommitment dare is to take it in chunks and walk through and go, am I actually doing things the right way, or do I need to delegate some of these things? And delegation to me is a two-part thing. There are some things that I could say, hey, Joe, is this something that you could help me with? And, you know, maybe delegate it to you or between us, right? I mean, maybe it's not something I have to entirely hand over. I had somebody come to me with a last minute deadline the other day and they said, hey, look, and it's like nine o'clock in the morning by noon, could you turn this around and, and give me this deliverable? And it was a big deliverable for them. And so I said, well, actually I can, sure. Let me take this on and deal with it. And so when they came back, they said, well, wait a minute. So you went to two other people to help you get the answer. And I said, yeah, you wanted it in this time frame. I, as one individual, probably couldn't have done it by myself, but with my team, you know, I was able to quickly turn this around and hand it back to you. And uh, they were a little surprised, but they delegated to me. I turned to my team and delegated to them <laughs> sort of this chain of events that happened. But we met the goal. I didn't become overcommitted. I still delivered on everything that I needed to that morning. I could have cleared my calendar maybe and done it myself. So that's just one example. But I love this idea. And I want to halt for a moment there because uh, I found that in my own life. I remember in my personal life with my kids, they were part of a swim club and it was delegated to me to oversee something. And I got partway through it. And the president of our club, Don, actually came to me and he said, hey, how's it going? I said, well, it's going great. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Joe, when I put you in charge of this, that that wasn't for you to do it all. And I think many of us do that, right? We internalize it. Don puts me in charge of a project. I think, man, I got to do that. And I don't think who else around me stands to win if this goes well. And there's often other people that are invested in the project. I think that's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a big part of change management as well. I mean, one of the things I'm trained in as well as is change management inside of organizations. And one of the biggest parts of change management is who else is in the boat with you? 
Yeah. So a lot of these things, whether it's personal or professional sort of things that we're working on, I mean, oftentimes by having other people with you, it builds your sort of your overall support for whatever it is that you're working on as well. And it ends up being better for everybody. I mean, it's better for the swim club if I don't do this all by myself. You know, it ends up being a being a better thing. Uh, by the way, people that heard my disappointment when you talked about the dare wasn't that wasn't that I was disappointed by the survey. I just want to be clear. I was disappointed <laughs> because I thought you were referring to a dare where I dared to become overcommitted. And I'm like, I'm already winning that dare. <laughs> yeah, right. So I was disappointed that that wasn't what you were talking about. That was the, the, the deal. But I love this because I like the assessment at the beginning. I want to ask you about one more thing here because it seems antithetical to the whole premise of overcommitment which is you write extensively about the role of time away, right? In the middle of the entire plan, you talk about taking time away, which seems anti-everything. I mean, you don't get further ahead in your job. You don't get further ahead of your life. You don't keep the pedal down, right? Like how does time away help you succeed? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I actually deal with a little bit early in the book as well is just this idea of burnout. So we don't talk about this a lot in the United States, I know, but it's a big global thing. And I was actually interviewing somebody yesterday for one of my podcasts and she brought up burnout as well. But this idea of burnout is just you have so much that you're just pedal to the metal all the time without a break. It essentially leads to a point where you can't sleep. You don't feel like eating. You also, you know, really cloudy in terms of your ability to make decisions and really execute. I mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of the worst thing for somebody that's already overcommitted. But at the end of the day, it's our mind and our body's way of saying, hey, look, you you can't stay awake 24-7. It's not possible. Uh, you also can't work pedal to the metal all the time. And then you actually start to find out that by taking breaks, even if they're short breaks, I mean, I also talk about meditation as well as it deals with, you know, the idea that, you know, I start my mornings every morning with a little bit of meditation. I also journal in the morning because I find that it helps me think about the things that I did yesterday as well as the things that I've got to do today. Those things really help me set out the, the real thought process for the rest of the day. And so whenever I woke up this morning, one of the first things on my list was this interview, right? I mean, you know, thinking through, okay, do I have the link? Do I have everything that I need to be successful, you know, whenever I join you? Those things really start to help me with this process of what I have to go through for the rest of the day. But also, like I said, people that watch all the things that I execute on typically in a day, they're just like, I can't believe that this is how, how much you actually get done. And it's just a matter of, you know, I start my day with this kind of process of making sure I'm ready for the day. I love this idea, though. You use a word in the book that I think we need to talk about more often, and I hope we do in 2023, and it's replenishment. I love that word, Don. Yes, it is a way as well. I mean, getting to take vacation, <laughs> which uh, oftentimes, you know, I mean, you think about the pandemic, some people some people that I know actually left the country to go somewhere else during the pandemic, which was available to them all of a sudden because they were entirely working remotely. I have a client that's in Canada that went to Mexico for a part of the pandemic and then kind of moved around throughout the pandemic. And she constantly was updating me on, you know, here's where I am now. And so it was a lot of a lot of fun for me to get to see somebody take vacation, but also leverage the opportunity of being virtual and just saying, hey, look, I'm going to use this in a way that's beneficial for me. And so she described her day as, you know, look, I work my normal work hours, but in the mornings and at night, I mean, we truly are on vacation. This is, you know, a true break for me. And I thought it was fantastic to leverage it that way. But I also think there's a danger there. I mean, I'm with you. I think that is super cool. But one of the results of COVID that you know is is this idea that we're not returning to the workplace like we usually do. And every study that we've talked about on Stacky Benjamin shows, people really want this hybrid workplace. How does a hybrid schedule affect your work-life commitments? Because I think if you're not intentional, like this could be a disaster. I completely agree with you, but I also think it is a way for companies to better define what it is that they want from people. 
and, and an opportunity for employees to come back and say, hey, look, I'll have to commit a lot more hours than, than there are available currently in the workday. I was heads down for the book itself, riding through a good portion of the pandemic. And so whenever I lifted my head back up, there was this term of quiet quitting. And I think it brings back this the same sort of idea, which is that should you, as an employer, be allowed to dictate to people what they do every hour of every day of the week? So let me start there. There are a lot of people that have, let's say, Etsy stores, YouTube channels, podcasts, <laughs> a variety of things, but they love their job. They don't, they aren't necessarily building a second way of being employed. Now, if they're super successful, they may have to reevaluate that at some point in time. So I think that would be fair as well. Now, with that, I think that there, there is a real opportunity for employers, though, to kind of come back and say, I'll do this hybrid thing, but my my thought process in terms of your output is this, and then have a discussion with the employee, right? I mean, I think that it needs to be much more output and, and goal-centered than anything else. And I've worked with virtual people most of my career, so I, I find this bigger debate a little interesting as well because I've seen people work a lot harder whenever they're remote and output a lot more uh, than whenever they're in the office as well. But that's also what scares me is that, you know, you and I have been working remotely for a long time and I have set these barriers, but I'm just afraid there's a lot of people that are hanging out with us that haven't established those barriers yet. And, I, and I'll tell you, you just have to be super intentional about that. When the day's over, you've got to find a way to block that off because otherwise it just, you know, that 10 o'clock at night thing you referenced earlier, Don, holy cow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't yeah. want that. There has to be a way where you, where you say, Hey, look, this is my time to cut it off as well in terms of your work day. But you also, on the other hand, I mean, I remember whenever I first started working remotely, my kids were young and uh, my wife was at home. And I remember she would, you know, sort of run in between things and then say, Hey, look, I'm going to go do this. Do you want to go do that? And I'm like, I'm, I'm working. I mean, essentially I'm in the office. I'm just not in an office. And right. so, you know, having those boundaries helps as well. And, you know, it takes a little bit of understanding on both sides. It was exactly the same. I had a friend who told me, uh, her name is Alice. She was a wonderful mentor. And she told me, make sure that you set the, just set the expectation of the people around you that you are at your quote office, like you are at the office, but after five o'clock, you're no longer at the office. And by the way, if you run out of stuff to do at two 30 in a particular day, stay at quote the office for the rest of the day. Cause they won't understand which, which has right. been by the way, fantastic setting these same times that after five, it's great. Before five, I'm at the office because, and, and by the way, I only know that because I violated it. And, and when you violate it once, all of a sudden your spouse goes, oh, well, you took off the other day in the middle of the day. Can't you do that? <laughs> right. You know, to can't you do that today? The book is called Overcommitted, How to Transform Your Habits and Achieve the Life You Desire. Uh, what a great way to begin 2023. Don, where do we get the book? It's available in all your favorite bookstores. You can also find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble online. You can buy the ebook, or I have a hardback that's also all color on the inside. And so, yes, you can find it everywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, happy new year, man. Let's stay under committed this year. How about that? That sounds great. Thanks so much, Joe. This is Rebecca from Connecticut. Instead of stacking Hamiltons and Jacksons, I'd much rather be stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Don Davis and what, uh, oh gee, what a good reminder here at the beginning of the year while you have new thinking. It's so easy to go, yeah, 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 I'll take on that, I'll take on that, I'll take I'll on that. I'll do it all. Yeah. It isn't, isn't going to be healthy. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, here at the beginning of the year, they put what you value first. Oh, it's 100% detox right now. It's all, <laughs> all like fruits, fruits and veggies, you know, green, <laughs> green energy drinks. Who's not doing that with me right now <laughs> on January 2nd? <laughs> I'm going on walks and runs, just hoping I sweat it out. Yeah. yeah. Still. Uh, it's your loved ones in your time. You'll probably be along 
longer with loved ones if you uh, maybe moderate a little bit. That's why they've made buying quality time. Veggie smoothies. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life. What a great way to start the new year. Get your financial plan in order. Get your life insurance in order. You'll find at Haven Life. It's a simple application. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. They have lovely customer support. And the cool thing is no waiting several weeks for a decision. And they're backed by a 160-year-old insurer called Mass Mutual. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to kick off 2023 with Curtis. Happy New Year, Curtis. Hey, Joe and OG. My wife and I are looking at getting a new credit card. We're having a discussion of diversity in our financial planning. She asked an important question that I don't think I've ever considered before. If something were to happen to me as the primary card holder for three of our existing credit cards, what happens if I pass away? Will she have access to those credit cards or would she lose access to that? I guess what I'm asking is, is it sensible for the next credit card that we sign up for, despite the fact that she's an authorized user on all three cards, would it make sense to open the new card in her name to provide ongoing access if something were to happen to me, if that's the case? Love your guys' take on it. Thanks. Oh, what a great question. And talking about some legacy planning, you know, for a spot that's sponsored by Haven Life and thinking about people other than yourself. Oh, gee, I like this. Is this does this make sense? I like this question. Yeah. I mean, every credit card company is going to be different on how they treat all of this. So it's almost like case by case and you have to read all, you know, that big booklet of stuff they give you when they're like, hey, here's your credit card and here's all the, yeah, you have to read all that. But generically speaking, of course, if you're nothing more than an authorized user and that person who was mainly responsible for it is no longer able to be responsible for it. And this doesn't have to be that they pass away. This could be they get into some financial trouble, uh, file bankruptcy. I remember a personal story years and years and years ago. I bought a car, but OG's credit wasn't as stellar as it is today. So OG's mom was like, I'll hook you up. I'll, I'll co-sign it, right? How many, how many times have people done that over years and years and years? And, you know, I'm good for it. So my mom's like, yeah, cool. I got you. No problem. Well, the, the shoe got put on the other foot. Mom got in trouble financially, not on her, you know, by herself. She, it's a disability. But anyways, filed bankruptcy. The day she filed bankruptcy, I got a call from a tow truck operator. And no joke, the guy goes, yeah, hey, I'm here to pick up the Acura. And I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, I just... I'm here to pay. I'm at your house. I'm here to pick up the Acura. I'm like, you're going to have to give me a little bit more info than that, buddy. And it was a Friday afternoon. And he goes, yeah, I don't know that you have to call the company. So I called them and they said, uh, yeah, we, we have a clause in our loan agreement that if one person defaults, then, then we call the loan. And I said, I, I, nobody defaulted. And they go, yeah, we count bankruptcy as defaulting. Oh. Even though we never missed a payment. We never, n- never was late, always on time. Had two years left on the loan, the bank went, Yeah, we don't care. Because if one person's doing it, the other person might do it. And so we're just coming to get our collateral. Wow. So the tow truck guy was super cool. I called him back and I said, Listen, I'm going to stay at the parking lot that I'm at until you get tired and go home. Because I can't let you take my car. I have to deal with this, but, I, but it's Friday. I can't, you know. He goes, I'll tell you what, you have all weekend. I'm done for the day. And to God, I'm not coming back till Monday morning unless my boss tells me you know, Monday morning that I have to go get it. So you've got all weekend to solve the problem. So yeah, come up with your entire car balance on Saturday afternoon at the bank. Like that's super easy to do, right? Wow. That happened to me. And so it can happen not with just passing away. It can happen with anything. It can happen with any financial issues. So I think we're responsible to protect, you know, both sides of that, honestly. Yeah. I just like the diversified nature of this. Just my gut. I didn't know where you were going to come down. But just the diversification of who owns what just makes it really easy afterwards. You know, if, if, if Curtis passes away and his spouse isn't primary on any cards, then she's got to at least make phone calls, right? 
and deal with all that stuff, knowing she's got one line of credit that she doesn't have to worry about at all because it's in her name, I think is, I think well, is comforting. Think of it. I mean, if you're doing the right stuff from a planning standpoint, hopefully you've got the adequate amount of life insurance and, you know, and you've got a plan for, okay, if this bad thing happens, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay off the house, send the kids to college, got enough money to pay the bills, you know, from now until the end of time. So that, that should be the case, but that doesn't happen immediately. You know, it's not like you get hit by a bus on noon and by four o'clock, you've got 2 million bucks in your bank account, you know, but you know, what does happen immediately. The freaking water bills do the gas bills do the mortgages do while you're sorting all this stuff out with a high stress, you know, a high, high amount of personal stress going on. And the mortgage company's going, Hey, your payment bounced. And you're like, I, I, I got it. I know I'm getting like, I just, I have, what, what account is this? Because they'll shut them down. And if you're like yeah. everybody else, you know, how do you pay your phone bill? Pay your phone bill by charging it to your Amex card every month. How do you pay your water bill? Charge us to your Amex card every month. How do you pay your gas bill? Charge us to your Amex card. And then Amex shuts down. Now what? Phone bill just stops working. Gas, you know what I mean? Like there's just all these dominoes and you're trying to put the pieces together. Forget the fact that you're going to have all the money. I think to your point, it's good to have a little bit of extra reserve where you can just go, <sighs> okay, I got it. Thanks for the question, Curtis. If you've got a question for us, stackybedjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, we're happy to send Curtis for being brave and for uh, asking his question out loud. It's a question I'm sure that a lot of people had. We're going to send him a Stacky Benjamins Haven Life t-shirt, which is the greatest money show on earth t-shirt. It's a circus and a very comfortable shirt. Incredibly comfortable. Love my, love my Haven Life uh, t-shirts uh, made by our friend Brad Lark down at uh, Flying Pork Apparel. If you want to see all of our stuff, by the way, stackybedjamins.com slash shirts. You can see it there. All right. That's going to do it for today. This week, we're getting back to normalcy. You'll find that on Thursday, I will be back on Instagram. Not sure who I'm going to be there with. In fact, we also have a guide to this show that goes deeper into all of our shows. It's called The 201. If you just want to know all the different places where you can follow us all for free because we are always doing things on multiple channels. Just get our welcome guide, stackybedjamins.com slash welcome. But if you're not here to uh, sign up to follow us on all these different channels, you're here because of the fact that you're worried about all of these recessionary discussions and the markets all over the place. And, you know, we talk about, uh, about these crypto companies blowing up. If you're concerned about all that, OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market, and the guide will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head on over to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide, and you'll get this helpful free guide from OG. And I think that's a great place to start 2023. All right, that's going to do it for today. Uh, Doug, I think you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, take some advice from Don Davis. Feel like you're spinning your wheels? Make sure you're spending your time on things that align with your personal goals. Second, when it comes to legacy planning with your credit cards, make sure you help out those left behind when you die. Have a reserve fund to take care of any bills after your credit card is shut down. But the big lesson... That kiss you might have on New Year's night is kissing your vehicle goodbye. Consider sleeping in your car that night just to be safe. <gasps> Thanks to Don Davis for joining us today. Find out more about his work and book, Overcommitted, at www.drdavisphd.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SP Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Seahot. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest Podcast. Take a deeper dive into all the topics we cover on each episode by checking out our newsletter, The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. 
And once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. You know, over the holidays, spending time with family, which is always fun. You know, you know us, OG, we play games and cards and really have a, have a fun few days just, just seeing people that I don't get to see enough with family. But of course, my sister lives in Ohio and went to the Ohio State University. And so they always bring these, these, or these, have you had these treats called Buckeyes that they serve? These Buckeyes. No. I refuse. Oh, oh, I, oh, I totally refuse to eat them. There's no way. Why would I eat eat these things called Buckeyes? Like they're these little round balls. And you hear about the real Buckeye, right? Which I think it's uh, it's like poison. Yeah, it's poisonous. Yeah. Which I think that school's kind of poisonous. But Agreed. Talking to you, Ohio State. <laughs> but, but anyway, as a Michigan, people new to the, new to the show, I went to Michigan State. And OG went to another school in Michigan that is a little stinky as well, but we won't talk about them right now. But it's always this time of year. It's always this time of year when my sister is trying to have me eat these little Buckeye things that I think about the true, the true holiday treat. What's about your balls, Pete? <laughs> for over at Seasons Eatings, we have balls for every taste. Popcorn balls, mm. cheese balls, rum balls, you name mm. it. Wow. My mouth's watering just thinking about those balls. <laughs> it's been years since I've seen any balls. Would you like to see my balls now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whip them out. Mm. Wow. You have some beautiful balls. <laughs> They're bigger than I expected. I know a lot of people tell me that. Can I touch your balls? Go ahead, but be careful. They're very delicate. Wow. Mm. I can't wait to get my mouth around this ball. Ooh, I like the way your balls smell. Wow, Pete. I have to say, your balls are so tender. Well, there's no beating my balls. They're made from a secret, sweaty family recipe. No one can resist my sweaty balls. Nothing Delicious. like a sweaty ball. Sweaty yeah. balls. Good times. Is, is that one of the best uh, Saturday Night Live skits of all time? It's, it's got to be that and the, um, and the Steve Martin, If I Only Had One Wish. <laughs> Between those two. It's, those are the top two, for sure. I think we'll save that one for next time. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody.